Today with a special focus on the COVID-19 social relief grant. A 350 rand, the grant is meant to give some assistance to those who have no income and have not been receiving any other kind of government assistance. But the grant is now about to be over and there are calls for government to make it an indefinite source of income for those who are struggling to survive. Now, as you well know, our reporters have been out in the field talking to recipients today, and the common answer is that they simply need more money. To top it off, there have been some issues with the payout of these grants. Sasa is, however, adamant that all legitimate payouts will be made. Well, I'm joined in studio now by the Social Development Minister, Lindy Wezulu. Minister, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your Happy invitation. birthday, and thank you for spending your day with thank us. Thank you. What a good day. <laughs> I'm glad. So I want to start with the positives on the story, because we are going to get to a lot of the issues, right? Okay. Let's start with how many people have actually been paid out this 350 Rand grant, because I know you mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, but is there an update now since the extension was granted? Yes, there is an update, but um, the ultimate will be at the end of it, because if we give the updates of saying we've paid 6 million uh, people already by now, but that's a calculation from the very beginning uh, of last year uh, until now, and the numbers obviously we have been fluctuating on month-to-month -month basis. And the reason for that is simply that we had to put systems in place of ensuring that people who receive the money remain the people who need it and not people who have gone back to work or people who've got other source of income. And that's what um, <clears throat> kept on fluctuating the dates. But when it comes to the applications, more than almost 10 million people um, applied that clearly indicates to you um, the, the situation out there and, and people who used to be able to hustle for themselves, finding themselves in a situation where because of the lockdown, they were now unable to do what they normally do to hustle for themselves mm -hmm. and their families. Yes, and there's just obviously a desperate need for that 350 rand. Yeah. So there were stats and information that we were looking at in terms of the amount of men versus women who received this grant. You know, there was concern that women were not getting it because their children were getting grants, social grants as well. But these were breadwinners, you know, single-headed uh, households. What's the numbers there? Do you know how many men versus women actually got this 350 rand? I don't necessarily have the complete figure of the numbers, but SASA has already indicated, and in their preliminary research, they're finding that more men uh, were, received the money than women. And I, we take it that there's one of the lessons that we have to learn from there, because we cannot run away from the fact that the majority of women are the breadwinners, and therefore when we're looking at further interventions that we need to do as government, we now need to take into consideration the experiences that we've had now. But also it's, it's, it's a question of many of the women, some of them receiving their child support grant, which is, by the way, less than uh, uh, the, 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 the amount that we would wish for as a Department of, of, of Social Development because it's below the poverty line. That's another angle of what we're trying to do now, to look at what is it that we can do to make sure that the child support grant is not less than... Uh, 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 what is expected. But um, for purposes of uh, future, because uh, I'm sure you're going to get to that point later on, for purposes of future interventions, it's important for us as a department as well as SASA to indicate that we will scrutinize the data once we have it in full because I personally think that uh, we should have maybe, had we known much earlier, we should have looked at other systems and ensuring that it is more the women who are the breadwinners, who are the caregivers, who should have received most of the money. But it also points to another issue. Mm. It's another issue of women being able to to access opportunities when they are present and it's about women being able to get the information at the right time and being able to fill up whatever needs to be filled up so that when we go through the processes of evaluating whether a person really deserves to have the money or not uh, we take that into consideration. Yeah. And then what about foreign nationals? There was an order that foreign nationals who are in the same position and in the country legally also received this grant. Did that happen? Yes, it did. But strangely, or no, maybe let me not say strangely, because <laughs> I, I know some of them are, are illegal in the country. Yeah. And therefore, uh, because we put systems in place, if we are illegal, we, we cannot process you. Uh, it was very clear that it's got to be people who are in the country, who are legal in the country, but also have the right papers. So 
the uptake for that was quite low. It was, it was less than a million, mm -hmm. far, far less than a million, the uptake. But of course, with the extension, we are yet to get the full uh, report because ultimately we have to present to the president the close-out report for the period that the president um, extended um, the social grants. Yeah. All right, so now let's talk about the difficulties that we encountered over the past couple of months with this grant. So Sasa is again just a couple of days ago apologizing for not being able to pay out this money to millions of people. And the reason they gave, Minister, was that there was, you know, a conflict or clash with its financial year-end tasks. But we know that the president said that this was going to be extended. Why didn't they plan for this? Well, look, they could have planned as much as they want. We could have planned as much as they want. What needs to be appreciated that at the end of each financial year, it's irrespective of what announcement had been made earlier on, there are due processes which Treasury as well as the Auditor General really looks at us uh, with a hawk's eye. Um, and I think that uh, Sasa has, what they did was to say, okay, because there was that gap between the end of the financial year and the the beginning of the financial year and because we knew what the financial year budget was going to be like then we're paying the April uh, 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 money through to everybody what is a gap is between in March, end of March, and the beginning of April, and therefore March became a problem because Sasa realized uh, not before not not immediately then but they they realized before that when it comes to this gap we are going to be in trouble. And that one really is not Sasa's fault. It's, it's, it's due process of government which must also be appreciated because we have to be accountable for all the resources. Every end of the financial year, those books must close. Yeah. And then if there's money that needs to be transferred from the previous to the next, there's also due process. Yeah. That was the main reason why Sasa found itself in that situation. But of course, when I had a meeting with them yesterday, I said the same thing, like, you know, guys, you knew this was coming. Yeah. So you could have done a little bit def differently. But then they said, Minister, the reason why we're paying the April despite that process is because we knew that this was going to be upcoming. Of course, it's painful because people were expecting that they're going to be paid in March. Um, and those people were not paid in March, uh, but they will be paid. Because remember that we also um, announced that those that had not been paid from the very beginning up to the end, we will stretch out until for no another two months just for us to wrap up the ones who had not been yeah. paid. So everyone who qualified and didn't get their money will eventually get that money. They have to get this. Yes. Yeah. They will get their money, and we made that announcement even before uh, the extension that the president made. As long as you qualified, you must get your money. Now, you and I will say that this was, you know, um, not their fault. They couldn't, you know, get around this. There would have been issues. But this 350 rand, as we said in the beginning, people rely on that 350 rand to buy bread, to mm. buy milk. Mm. And because of issues at Sasa, and whatever they are, they might be legitimate, they might not be legitimate, it might be human error. Mm. Because of those issues, those people, millions of people, didn't get that 350 rand. So they struggled. They struggled through the month. They probably went to bed hungry. You're the social development minister, right? Yeah, no, I cannot. I cannot run away from that. I cannot deny that. Um, I know very well what the 350 means for a, a whole lot of people, and, and that, that was the reason why Sasa had to apologize for that because we know what that means. But one thing we can assure the public is that they will get um, uh, their money. Unfortunately, we, we it would have it would have been they would have received it much earlier, but they were not able to receive. You, look, uh, when in the at the bigger scheme of things, when I look at it and I think of the fact that this SRD 350 was the first of its nature, unlike the other social grants which we were able to just plug into the system and extend. In fact, uh, Sasa, at the beginning of May, remember you recall that there was an issue of people who were not paid and people who were paid. We managed to get uh, that money back because it was almost like 9 billion rands. We managed to claw back on that because they were able to correct. So at any moment when government puts a new system in place, unfortunately it doesn't take 
It's not that easy to plug it in. And this was a completely new uh, system we had to put in place. We had two weeks um, to, to uh, get the system for application, get the system for processing, get the system for paying. And we, I must thank the private sector, even though, of course, it's the banks that had to step up and also assist us in ensuring that people do get their money uh, at a cost, uh, obviously. But we must just always appreciate then if government needs to make sure that it's accountable for the money, it needs to also put uh, good systems in place. Yeah. And then the issue of lines, I mean, we had our reporters out earlier as well during the week and several times. I mean, I haven't spoke to a person uh, in those lines a month ago. We're still seeing that happen. Why? Look, it's still going to be happening. I, I think it's still going to happen. Let me put that up front. It's still going to happen until such time that at the post office and the work that we're trying to do with the post office, the post office is inside. It's, it's not a proper functioning office. We've got to help it to function. Yeah. For future, we've got to use technology. And I'm working well with the minister, uh, Minister Stelanda Bene Abrahams. And I think that... We, I cannot run away or deny the fact that the post office has got a very good infrastructure from a spread throughout the entire country. But the spread and infrastructure are two things that we need to deal with and what happens inside uh, the post office. I think the, the queues were also created by the fact that we're, we're not operating at a full optimal number of people that had to be in the post office or number of people that had to be, uh, at least the banks were, were better off, people who used the ATM, they were better off. I think we can turn the post office around. Its infrastructure is just too big mm. to allow, to, to let it go. So we have a plan uh, and we're looking at technology. We're looking at um, technology to be used in changing the way people access the money. We are in a, in a long discussion already by now to see what kind of technology can we use. Can you, you can see that even the amount of the money that we're using in paying social grants physically, we had huge challenges because that was easier, yeah. but the security... Uh, and by the way, that also killed the, the entrepreneurial side of things. You know, when people were getting their money in cash and then yeah. small businesses would come there and sell, but it became a little bit difficult due to security yeah. concerns. Yeah. All right, so um, like I was saying, we've been covering the story quite extensively on ENCA, and we were on the streets today asking people about what this 350 rand meant to them and why they want an extension. Because it's not just Tuli Madonsela and activists calling for it. These are South Africans who are struggling. I want you to take a listen to what some of them said to us, and then we'll discuss it. Okay. As us until today has not returned our, our request, and it's a, it's a big concern, and now there's other, there are other developments that are coming or taking place that now people are hearing, are being approved, and when they go and come and collect their social grants, nothing is happening. And when they go to Sasa, Sasa says, though, no, the money was being tra uh, transferred and so on. So it's, it's a worrisome factor. And, and, and I must tell you, Ron, that uh, uh, this is, this is, this is, this, this, this is it's, it's, it's a real setting issue because we're in disaster. And you can't divorce disaster from uh, 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 poverty. And poverty leads to, to social conflicts. In social context, this is social instability, which is a very worrisome factor as leaders of the village. My last question to you is uh, what's the way forward? Because it seems like many people are losing hope. You know, I would, I would, I would love to, to ask that question myself. Our way forward as responsible leaders of the community will keep on persuading the, the, the government officials from these agencies to come and sit with us down and find a way forward in how we can best serve our people in making sure that they can sustain themselves during these trying times of COVID-19. Assist people with social relief grants, with, uh, also with SASA online applications. And then uh, we find lots of problems on their system. Uh, main challenge is that uh, they give reasons that people are on either on UIF or they, they need to submit their IRP files, which most of them they claim they have never worked before. And secondly, there are people who the system said they are being paid at the post office, but they don't know which post office or how, because they are supposed to get SMSs to say you must go and collect your money from this post office. So they cannot track their monies where they are. Because I have uh, an individual who's been 
On the system, they're getting money since May last year, but they have not received a cent. So we have situa situations like those. All right, so I know you obviously don't have the money in your pocket because that comes from Treasury and the President has to decide. You listen to these people who are struggling to survive, who are struggling to put food on the table. They're asking for an extension to this grant. What would you say to them? Well, if I had the money and if, if, if I was the one that's responsible for that, probably I would say let us continue it. But at the same time, we need to be considerate of the fact that there's a bigger picture um, there's a budget that and the demand on the budget is quite huge for different uh, departments, education, health. All these departments are also looking out for money. And by the way, the money that is being spent by other departments is money that is going to almost the same citizens. So as a Minister of Social Development, we have already made the presentation ourselves to say, firstly, we thank the President for having, um, be, having been very uh, thoughtful and, 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 uh, in terms of the people that are speaking right now. Way back then, on the, first of, on the 21st of April, the President made this announcement, and this announcement was made on the backdrop of appreciating and understanding the challenges that are faced by the very same people who are speaking here. But I do want to make the statement that while we've made the presentation in according to our own analysis, we are also very conscious of the fact that the, the budget is, is constrained. Everybody is looking for money. But secondly, we are also looking as a department what other options are there for us in supporting our people from a point of view of being able to uh, do things for themselves, those that form cooperatives, those that start businesses, uh, the, the program which we call the EPWP program, which has also employed uh, quite a number of, of people. So we're not only looking at just the 350, we're looking broadly at saying, yes, the 350 has been very helpful to our people, but what other options are available for our people? Where else can we direct our people? And the direction for me is more on sustainable uh, income that people might receive rather than just the 350. But we also appreciate that the 350 has made a big difference. Yeah. So I can say officially ourselves we've made um, uh, that request, but I am also conscious of the fact that there's many other areas of work and money is needed in a number of things, which, by the way, serves the same communities. Yeah, but then you get millions going to bail out struggling SOEs, and they're struggling because of looting and corruption, right? It's not because they uh, weren't uh, good business modules. It's because of theft at those organizations. Well, without, I really, I really don't. Money. No, I don't want you to narrow the whole issue of the challenges of SOEs only to corruption. Corruption, yes, I fully agree with you. We need to deal with it. And I think this government from the very beginning has been doing everything it can to make sure that that corruption is curbed. But you cannot ignore a whole range of other factors of how to run institutions that we never used to run before, how to make sure that you get the right people in those institutions, not only from a point of view of people who are corrupt, but getting the qualified people, the right people with the right qualifications, and the right people with the right thinking, and the right people who, even when they have a strategy, they go out and make sure that they implement that strategy. Yeah, but it's yeah. been over two decades. Are we well, still looking for the right people? No, I don't think two decades is a, is a long enough time. You know, sometimes we, we underestimate what governance is. We underestimate what is to run a country. We underestimate what it takes for the people who are genuine in it. Because it's not everybody who is out there who's doing something, trying to be positive, is corrupt. Mm -hmm. It's not everybody who is there. You do and you will find in all aspects of our lives, even in the private sector, you'll find that there are those people that do something. But if I were to look, and fortunately I'm an experienced international relations person, I've traveled the entire continent, I've traveled the world. I look at what we have been able to do in South Africa, and I look at what I see in the outside. I think this nation is in the right direction. What makes this nation also to be in the right direction is the willingness to accept your weaknesses, is the willingness to find those faults, is the willingness to even say there's corruption, let's dig it, and let the people who are found to be corrupt face uh, the law. Yeah.
uh, hopefully they do one day because we're still waiting for people to be in orange overalls, right? So while I, <laughs> while I have you here, <laughs> I must ask you about this because you were sitting there while I was reading those two stories about ANC members, prominent figures within the ANC, you know, Jacob Zuma losing his legal team again, uh, him going against the Zondo Commission, Kusela Diko challenging the Gauteng uh, uh, ANC's decision as well. What would you say is the current state of the ANC? The African National Congress is alive and it's living and it's leading. If we narrow the challenges that are being faced by the African National Congress to the challenges that we face now, then people aren't analyzing where the ANC came from and what happened in the ANC long, long time ago and how the ANC got to be where it is today and what the challenges are. Those of us who were out of the country, living from one place to the other, Challenges like this, we face them. Mm. One day, me and you will sit down and I will talk to you about challenges where comrades were shooting at each other. You understand, in yeah. Angola, under very difficult circumstances. And here is that very same African National Congress. We're still standing, and I think that we've got a role in the future of South Africa. What is good is the fact that we are opening up ourselves as the African National Congress to be criticized, to be told where we're going wrong. When all is said and done, it will be how we respond mm. to that constructive criticism. I'm a member of the African National Congress since uh, 1977. I'm still a standing member of the African National Congress. And I can tell you, many of us will die being members of this African yeah. National Congress. But one thing we will not have is ourselves not being critical and not accepting a, a, a constructive criticism from the outside. If we don't do that, I'm sure we would die. But the reason why we're still standing today, despite all that, is because we are willing to open ourselves up. There's democracy in South Africa. This very democracy we're talking about, we were the architects of this democracy, working with other political parties. But even before we uh, developed this uh, architecture of democracy today, we were learning lessons from other countries who were free before us, uh, the likes of O.R. Tambo, the late, is a person that traveled across the country, and every time he came to talk to us, he said, as we're preparing to go home, let us learn lessons from the other countries. Yeah. So I, I get that, and I get your allegiance, obviously, because of everything you've been through. I mean, you left the country in 1976, right? I mean, you know why you joined the ANC and how you fought for democracy in mm -hmm. this country. But this architecture that you're talking about, they are members within the party and they're very prominent members who are taking you back a good couple of steps. They're not going to take us And back. the ANC is taking a long time to deal with those people because, mm. you know, you keep talking about it. We're talking about fighting corruption. We're talking about a step-aside resolution for months. And South Africans will wonder, but when are you actually going to get rid of these people? Because they are working against everything you and so many other struggle veterans fought for. By the way, they also work for what we have today. So let's not do the separation and, and, and pretend like these comrades who are finding themselves in trouble today never contributed to the liberation struggle. But it doesn't justify. They, Contributing no, no. to the liberation no, there's two, struggle doesn't no. justify you doing wrong mm, in a democracy. No, no, no. Let, let's not mix the issues. I'm not justifying. I have no intention whatsoever to justify what we believe is wrong that they have they have done. But let us also accept that there are due processes. Mm. You are talking about President uh, Zuma, former President uh, Zuma, and we are talking about due processes. Those are the due processes. Those are the due processes that must not be disturbed by anybody. At the same time, the very same comrades that you are talking about, including uh, DECO and all, they also have a responsibility, but they also have the rights, by the way, to say, we're challenging this because we're not happy with this and that. Yeah. So th that's where I personally believe those due processes, we put those due processes in place. From a governance point of view, those processes we put there, and we didn't say we're putting those those due processes for some other people of our society and others are not. Those due processes, constitutionally, legal processes, those due processes are for everybody, yeah. including Diko, who is now saying, yes, African National Congress, my party, you've come to this conclusion. I'm not happy with some of the conclusions that you have made. She's got the right to go back and say, I'm actually not happy with what I'm, what I'm seeing here. 
it's a due process. It will yeah. either find her on the other side or on the other side. Let's yeah. give the due process. Yeah, no, due process is a thing, but, you know, action regarding the concerns that the public has is something that needs to be taken, right? I mean, we, we like, wouldn't... there are so many instances where people have been found guilty of fraud, but they're still within the party playing prominent roles. Look, we wouldn't have put due process if we didn't believe it is correct for us to do so. You're talking about people who have been taken into to task for the things that we have done. And they are out there in the public, and we're saying to the public, believe us because we want uh, to be uh, exemplary in what we do. But I also don't want us to think that it's just as easy as that. You just wrap people and throw them away. No, it doesn't work like that. Once you have due process, let the due process go through. Because how long the due process takes, it's another issue. Maybe other people might be irritated about it. But one thing I know about this country is the fact that I can be a minister, I can be a president, I can be anything. If I am found guilty of anything, the law will take its course. And we've seen that the law is taking its course in South Africa. So very quickly. How long it takes, but the law is taking its course. You see, you talk about how long, and I'm saying very quickly, because I'm running out of time. <laughs> You're welcome. What's your birthday wish for the ANC? What needs to happen to get the party to uh, all of its former glory that we know it as? It, 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 first, for me, what I've been crying out for for a very long time is to, one inculcate within our comrades the reason why we fought in the first place. But to do that, we also have to be conscious of the fact that situations and environments change. And therefore, in that process, some of our own end up being on the wrong side. The ANC must be able to have its own systems that are strong enough to be able to say this and that it's not going to work yeah. for the African National Congress. And I think that's the future. You see, we're dealing with the young people now. We're de dealing with the youth league now. And I'm saying, as we, some of us, will step aside uh, from politics in the future because of natural progression, we're yeah. going to grow older. Let the young people step in and let the young people look at what we've been able to do, the good they build on it. And then what is not good, they then should be able to say, as young people, future leaders, we're, gonna, we're not going to have this happen. Yeah. I want to I wanna end on a very light note. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I want you to watch something. And I always watch you in Parliament and all the sass you have. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look behind us. We're going to play you a clip. I want you to see this. Chairperson, point of order. My name is Lindiwe Daphne Zulu. The one who refers to me, Ginger. The ginger shall be outside. Okay. All your sass, all that sass, you know? That's something we see from you in Parliament all the time. We always see you yelling, throwing your hand out at opposition party members. Well, it's part of the, the struggle. The struggle yeah. continues right in there. Yeah, and, in yeah. Parliament, and, 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 and that's something we need. We need vibrant politicians who are working in the best interest of this Look, country. Look, we, we need vibrant politicians, but also we need to be conscious of the fact that we have a constitution and inside the house we've got rules, we've got all that. We've got to try and keep the decorum of the house. Sometimes it becomes a bit too hot yeah, to honorable. keep the decorum. I'm always wondering, where's the honorable here when we see uh, Sometimes it column. goes the other way. Yeah, it but, goes the other way. No, but um, th there's a history. You know, if you look at where we come, come from and where we are today, and the future, I, I would not uh, turn that back again. I yeah. think uh, it's something that I can relive again. Yeah. It's, it's building of our democratic institutions, and sometimes we need to do that. <laughs> All right. Minister, thank, thank you. you so much for your time. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Have a great birthday. Thank I hope you. you. Have a good evening and a thank very you. successful year. Thank you very much, and you thank you. you for the opportunity. I appreciate yeah. you speaking to me. That, of course, is Social Development Minister Lindy Wezulu.